thank you for the invitation to come and talk to you today. And I'm going to be telling a story myself. And what I'd like to tell you is a bit of a story that we use my own experiences in writing uh, what turned out to be a trilogy of books about soil and soil health that um, we've, my experiences, my wife's experiences, science and history together. And really, it's a story about why are soils so important and why is recycling organic matter a key piece of what I like to view as one of humanity's largest natural infrastructure projects, which is bringing our soils back to life, restoring fertility to our agricultural lands. See the covers of the three books up there? Uh, the Dirt was the one I wrote about 10 years ago that started me thinking about soils, and it's a geologist's view of soil. And I'm a geologist, so that's not a crazy thing to have done. And it followed my interest in looking at soil erosion as a long-term problem, uh, looking at the experiences of ancient societies. And as geologists tend to do, it's a fairly backward-looking book. It looks back through history. But it got me really interested and excited about the problem of soil degradation. I'll give you a summary of that book, as well as that middle one, The Hidden Half of Nature, that tells the story of how um, my wife and I, and to be honest, mostly my wife, restored fertility to the land, our lot in North Seattle, and that opened our eyes to the, the value of organic matter and compost and feeding the microbes in the soil as a key piece of restoring fertility to the land. And the most recent one on the right, Growing a Revolution, uh, was a story of going out and learning from farmers around the world how to apply those ideas that we were exposed to in writing that middle book, how to apply that to large-scale farming operations, how to apply it to municipal sewage operations. It's a I kind of feel like I've been learning about this stuff in public now for 10 years, but it's um, it's been a great pleasure to to meet people like some of the people that I will be describing and telling a bit of their story as I essentially recalibrated and retooled my view of the importance of soil for the longevity of civilizations. So I'm going to start by depressing you for a few minutes uh, because that way I get to bring you back up by the end of the talk, hopefully. Um, and the depressing view is the state of the world's soils viewed globally. This map is the UN's map of soil degradation for, from a few years ago now, and it shows you areas of the world where the soils are very degraded or degraded in terms of their agricultural production potential. And you notice there's an awful lot of orange and red areas on that map. Uh, and if you add up the amount of topsoil that's been eroded off of farmland around the world since the dawn of agriculture, we've quite literally burned through at least a third, and some even estimate up to about half of our natural endowment of fertile topsoil on the planet. That's a pretty shocking number. But if you look at the most recent study uh, that assessed the state of the soil, the UN's Global State of the Soil Assessment from 2015, they estimated that humanity loses about another one-third of 1% 1 of our global food production capacity each and every year due to soil erosion and degradation. Now, that's a small number, 0.03%. It kind of reminds me about, you know, my bank account yield and things like that. But looking at this kind of a pace of loss from that same kind of long-term time scale, kind of a time frame that a geologist might think is actually really relevant and important to the longevity of civilizations, you project out by the end of this century, we may have uh, degraded another third of our agricultural production capacity. If you add on that back to the top of the at least a third that we've already degraded planet-wide, we could be on track to have degraded roughly two-thirds of our agricultural potential globally by the end of this century, while our population is expected to rise by another 30 to 50 percent. Those trends are obviously working against each other in terms of our ability to feed the world of the future. That should be sobering. And, but it's not just a modern problem. There are analogs back through history that we can look at and learn from. And that's what I started researching when I uh, dug into writing the Dirt Book. Uh, and it was started as sort of a pursuit of an idea that um, I found really interesting and fascinating, and, and I just wanted to research it and dig into it uh, in terms of what had soil erosion, the kind of thing I study in natural landscapes, the things that shape topography. That's the kind of geologist that I am. I study the processes that form landscapes. But what about post-glacial landscape uh, and the one that humans have influenced? By the time I was done writing the book, I realized I was writing a history of farming, because that is where the impact really lay. Because you can go back and demonstrate, as I did, and that others have done before me, I claim no great originality for that insight, uh, that soil erosion played a role in the demise of many ancient civilizations, uh, from Neolithic Europe, classical Greece, Rome, southern United States, Central America, and more that I describe in the book. But what I found surprising was not so much that soil erosion was important. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have gone down this road to look into it in the first place, right? 
Um, what I found really surprising is that the explanation you tend to see in environmental history textbooks for the soil degradation that impacted ancient societies was typically deforestation. And it's typically described in that one word, deforestation. But if you really go back and look at it, it wasn't the ax that caused the soil erosion. It was the plow that followed the ax. It was maintaining the land in a bare and vulnerable state through the act of plowing, through tillage. I like to think of as conventional agriculture because we've been doing it for a very long time in a large portion of the world. And how could it be that, that plowing, tillage, could actually be a net bad? I mean, after all, many of us are taught to turn our swords into plowshares. And yet there are those who would argue that the plow has done far more damage to far more civilizations, perhaps, than the sword. How could that be? Well, think about what a plow does to the land surface. It inverts the surface of the earth, which makes it such good weed control, after all, which is why one of the reasons it's been so popular in many civilizations. But it also leaves the land surface bare and vulnerable to erosion by wind and rain. And that can really add up over time, especially if you think like a geologist, that the century is a, a sort of round-off error on history, uh, or that a millennium is kind of getting into the right ballpark, we can start thinking about decent scales of change. Um, soil erosion from plow-based agriculture is actually and rates ahead of soil production to such an extent that it has stripped soils off of large areas that used to be agriculturally quite productive. Now, I'm going to pick a little bit on eastern Washington for a minute because there's a, a couple great historical photographs that I can use to illustrate the problem of soil erosion through the, the lens of a geologist. And this, this particular slide is from the Palouse in eastern Washington. It was taken back in 1970, and it shows you a winter wheat field, but you don't see any wheat, do you? What you see is bare soil after plowing, and then a rainfall occurred, and all these little channels are cutting into the soil. Uh, they're fairly easily removed with a single pass of the plow. Uh, they're that's sort of an agricultural nuisance on a year-to-year -year basis, but they add up over time. And this shows you another winter wheat field uh, in the Palouse, a picture taken back in 1961 uh, and it, uh, by Vern Kaiser. And it shows you a, um, a farm field that was a winter wheat field where in 1911, the soil was up to this level on the edge of the field. And that fence is a fence that the farmer installed to protect their water cistern because he didn't want to plow over his water cistern. And the only thing that's happened in this field for the 50 years between 1911 and 1961 when the photo was taken was it was annually plowed uh, and you had those little rills develop year after year. And this bit of a cliff developed along the fence line. And you can actually still, if you have LIDAR data from areas in, in Iowa or Eastern Washington, you can see the elevation changes that uh, occur across some of the fence lines in the region. And what you haven't seen yet is sort of how big a deal this is. What's that scale? There's a little bar that goes from about there to there. It's pretty washed out on this screen, but it's a one-foot increment on a stadia ride. This is about a five-foot cliff. This represents about five feet of erosion in 50 years, or about, that pencils out to what, about a foot every decade, or an inch a year. And there's nowhere on earth that soils form at a pace of an inch a year. Other, that is, garden, but we'll get there. And perhaps your garden, too. <laughs> um, so what's the magnitude of this kind of historical soil erosion at broader scales? Showing you a single field, you should go, well, that's a really extreme example. And of course it is. That's why I like to use it. It gets people starting to think that, well, maybe this guy's not crazy after all. Um, and if you look at the American Southeast, uh, it's an example where people have actually gone through and quantified the amount of soil erosion since the advent of colonial agriculture, since the plow arrived in the Southeast. So we're showing Virginia up here in the upper right, down to Alabama in the lower left. And this gray noodle shows you the area for which four to 10 inches of topsoil has been eroded over the last 200 years. Uh, the black areas are where more than 10 inches have been eroded. Well, how big a deal is that? If you go back and read the original journals of the people who are breaking this land for the first time and describing their soils, they had about six to 12 inches of rich black earth over their subsoil. So if we could erode off a third to almost all of the topsoil across a region that was one of the original bread baskets of the American colony, we could do it in 200 years with pretty much the same technology that the Romans and Greeks had. Imagine what they could have done a thousand year run at their landscape, five times the, the, the duration. It starts to put into perspective the idea that stripping the topsoil off the landscape through the long term use and reliance on the plow might actually. But what else does it do to the soil? It doesn't just render the soil vulnerable to erosion by wind and rain. It also helps accelerate the degradation of organic matter. 
This shows you um, two soils. Uh, one is from a tobacco plantation in North Carolina, a place where I was um, I went out to a couple years ago to try and um, generate a good example for a TV show about what's the magnitude of the extent of soil degradation in North America. I thought, okay, we've got three minutes to do this in, in this one little segment they have. Let's go look what happened in that gray noodle that I was just showing you. This is the uh, conventionally managed uh, uh, field at a USDA research farm. Uh, it basically looks a lot like beach sand, and it is. It's tertiary beach sand. You have beach sand from 10 million years ago, uh, but there's not much organic matter in it anymore. It's essentially has, uh, uh, it's crusted, has a fair amount of salts in it, um, but it doesn't look very rich. This is the soil in the, in the forest right next door that hasn't been farmed for 100 years. It's getting back towards what the soil was like originally in this area. And there's farms in this region where essentially you go to and they're farming the subsoil. The topsoil is quite literally gone. For the soil scientists in the room, the O and the A horizon, gone. They're farming B horizon. And it's pretty easy to tell the difference. Um, and basically what we've done, managed to do nationally is turn a lot of our farmland soils from stuff that's dark and rich like this into stuff that looks like that. Uh, we've lost, the estimates I've seen are that we've lost about half of the soil organic matter from our agricultural lands in the United States in the last couple hundred years. Think about that. That's half of the native fertility of our land in just a few centuries. It starts to put in the idea that the long-term effects of agriculture, and, remind, and mind you, this is before what we call conventional agriculture today, because there were no agrochemicals in Roman days. Long-term reliance on the plow can seriously degrade our ability to produce food off of the landscapes that we rely on to feed ourselves. And so I wanted to, by uh, triangulating these kind of uh, 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 illustrations and stories, I wanted to actually convince myself that, well, do these numbers pencil out when you take advantage of all the modern data that we have on rate of topsoil loss that agricultural researchers and agronomists have been so dutifully collecting for the last century or so, and for which we don't have in classical Greece, French Rome, or the Mayan Empire, or Easter Island, or Tibet, or all the other societies so that we can look back through history. So what I did is I went and I actually spent about a month in the library compiling data to try and figure out that question of how fast are contemporary agricultural fields eroding globally, worldwide. And I'll spare you all the details of the data, but let me tell you that, that simply there's a wide variation. I'm showing you the averages here. If you're really interested in the data, there's a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences where I put an Excel spreadsheet that has all the data, all the studies. Nobody should ever have to re, um, you know, research this stuff. Just go steal my Excel spreadsheet and, and start making it bigger and share it with people. But what this shows you are the kinds of erosion rates I measured over there on the left. The median or average rates on the right, so half the studies were lower, half the studies were higher. We're just looking at the middle of the road. And the numbers in parentheses are the numbers of peer-reviewed studies that I used to generate the averages on the right. So it just simply shows you how much effort went into this. So in terms of conventional agricultural erosion, what I mean is plow-based agriculture, anywhere from uh, the developing world to, to modern uh, uh, high-tech farms in North America. And the average rate is about a millimeter and a half a year. The range is actually huge, from tiny fraction of a millimeter a year up to pushing a meter a year in, in some like horrendous studies. Uh, but average globally, millimeter and a half a year. That's a slow rate, right? Your fingernails grow 10 times faster than that. And who would argue that that's really fast? Well, a geologist would, <laughs> um, because a millimeter and a half a year turns out to be orders of magnitude higher than soils form naturally. How do I know that? Well, I actually compiled studies that look at rates of soil production over the long run, and they form at about 2% of a millimeter a year. That's right in line with the USDA standard line that it takes about 500 years to make an inch of fertile topsoil. Um, it's not a bad estimate for what it takes nature to convert bedrock into rich topsoil. If we look at long-term rates of erosion under native vegetation or long-term geological erosion rates going even deeper in time, we see numbers that are pretty similar to the rates of soil production. And that's actually good because in our experience, you know, most places in the world are covered with topsoil. You have to go up to the high alpine areas or real deserts to find places where there's not much in the way of topsoil. This world is generally covered by soil. It's one of the things that makes it habitable. Um, so these are relatively in balance, but notice there's several orders of magnitude lower than the rates of conventional agricultural erosion off the farm fields. Unless you look at no-till farming, that blue number, it's a lot closer to these long-term natural rates of, of um, erosion.
Therein lies the good news, because the, the bad news may be that we're bleeding topsoil off the world's farmland, but the good news is that the problem isn't that we farm, it's how we've been farming. And if we farmed using no-till uh, practices, which have their own idiosyncrasies and applications in different areas, and that I'll get into a little more in a minute, um, we can bring soil erosion down to at least within a factor of a couple of long-term rates of soil production. And to a geologist, if you're within a factor of two, it's virtually the same number. So we'll, we can we get, tend to get concerned about differences of orders of magnitude. Now, if you can also play on the back uh, of your napkin, the little experiment we like, or game that we like to play with graduate students called, you know, back of the envelope calculations, you can use the information I've just provided you to basically calculate the average longevity of an agricultural civilization. And basically, the logic goes as this, a net loss of a millimeter a year or so of soil, and recall that that's a conservative estimate given, you, given the numbers I've just shown you. You could erode a half meter to one meter thick hill slope soil, sort of a one to three foot thick hill slope soil, in just 500 to about 1,000 years. Uh, and that, it turns out, is approximately the lifespan of most major agricultural civilizations, with some really big exceptions. And those really big exceptions are the ones we tend to hear about on major river floodplains. Some of the really early agricultural societies that developed on the deltas of the world that built out once sea levels stabilized in the post-glacial world and rivers started dumping sediment into the Mediterranean and the Gulf of Arabia um, and built places like the, the delta of the Tigris and Euphrates and the Nile. And it's those places, Tigris and Euphrates, the Nile, the Indus and the Brahmaputra, the big rivers of lowland China, those are the places where we've managed to maintain agricultural civilizations over thousands of years, in great part because annual flooding on a floodplain or in a delta replenishes anything that was eroded off from last year. And if you're losing soils at a rate of a millimeter a year or so, you can replenish them at that kind of a rate on a floodplain. And you could have sustainable agriculture with the plow. But think about the areas that are upstream of those areas that had uh, those long-lived civilizations. Think about, say, Syria in the headwaters of the of, um, in Mesopotamia. Think about Somalia and Ethiopia in the headwaters of the Nile, the Himalayan, the headwaters of the Indus and the Brahmaputra, eastern Tibet in the headwaters of the, the, the rivers that drain, drain through low in China. Those are areas that have been impoverished over the long run by degradation of their soils that essentially subsidized the prosperity of civilizations downstream. Okay, well, hopefully I'm now through the depressing part. Because if we look back through history, we don't have a whole lot of really good examples. There are a few, and I lay them out in the book. There are a few. Uh, but we don't have a whole lot of really good examples of societies that took care of the soil over the long run. What we might today call sustainable farming. But this motivates the question, obviously, of can we turn this long-term pattern around? Could we actually rebuild the fertility of the world's soils? And it took me two more books in 10 years to actually comfortably get to an optimistic answer that, yeah, I think we can. And I don't think it would be that hard, and I think we could do it actually pretty fast. We just have to think about soil differently. And, you know, the, the line that you guys will really like, I think, we have to start recycling organic matter at a large scale, a huge scale. We have to start along those lines. And what led me to those kind of conclusions? It was basically restoring life to our garden. Um, and I wrote The Hidden Half of Nature with my wife, Ann Clay. She's a biologist. And you might think that, uh, you know, what makes for fertile soil? It's the marriage of geology and biology. So it's probably, you know, shouldn't be too surprising that we would put our heads together and write this book. But I can vouch for uh, that both of us would say that we hadn't, when we started to um, make a garden in our we hadn't planned on writing about it. So we didn't collect a lot of data. We didn't run it as a scientific experiment. We just wanted a garden. This is the house that we bought in North Seattle back uh, in the late 90s. And it came with a, you know, a house and then a yard. That yard had, well, well one plant, grass. <laughs> I thought it was actually okay. The dog loved to chase a ball on it. I could get the grad students over to play, play croquet once a year. Um, but Anne was a gardener. She wanted a garden. So a couple of years uh, after we bought the house, once we sort of recovered from that, we, start, we stripped that lawn off and we found that we had this incredibly rich, fertile black soil that North Seattle is known for. <laughs> we had glacial till. I mean, we had stuff that looked a lot like that, um, that North Carolina tobacco plantation, except nature did it. We, did, uh, we didn't do it. So we had till and fill. We didn't find a single worm when we peeled that lawn off. I like to think of it as an old growth Seattle lawn, six inches of tangled roots. You know, worms would have gone down and gone, where's the soil? Um, 
And uh, keep your eye on the neighbor's house back there. It'll show up again in another few slides. But basically, this was not the kind of soil that a gardener wanted to find when she peeled the lawn off the house um, or, or the lawn off the yard. There is a lawn growing on the roof of our garage, but we all know about that in Seattle too, right? <laughs> um, so what did Ann do? She realized that we had um, only half of that recipe for fertile soil. We had the geology part. We had ground up bits of Canada that got deposited when the Puget uh, low overran uh, Seattle 17,000 years ago dropped bits of Canada, then ran over them with a mile-high wall of ice to make nature's concrete. But we didn't have was the biology. We didn't have the organic matter. And so she painted up her wheelbarrow. And you, you, it's surprising how much thought, energy, and dedication can go into getting just the right flame thing from just the right auto place to, to make it work. But she started getting wood chips from the, the arborists in the neighborhood. She started um, acquiring uh, leaves from our neighbors. Um, you can be surprised. Well, perhaps not surprised how friendly the neighbors are when you show up with your wheelbarrow, rake up their leaves, and take them home to your house. Um, she started growing plants in the yard that would basically be annuals that she'd then knock down and let rot, essentially like a cover crop, uh, sort of the brown goods for his carbon sources, green goods for nutrition sources. She started adding um, uh, composted coffee grounds that we would get from behind the neighborhood coffee shop. We started... Um, uh, composting our food scraps and got a worm bin. And then we then we so we sort of gradually ratcheted up our efforts to bring organic matter back to the yard. We, we got truckloads of Zudu. Um, we basically then started um, inoculating um, um, an aerated bucket full of molasses with the uh, uh, with our worm compost to basically brew up compost tea. And we started spraying it all over the yard, all over the plants. And I was sort of thinking, well, you know, is this going to do any good? What I, I was, I was deeply skeptical. Anne was deeply optimistic, and I've never been happier to have been so wrong in my life, because we basically found after about three years, we started noticing that our soil was changing color. It was getting darker, and it was starting to rise. It was starting to the soil was starting to uh, tower, you know, a little quarter inch above the patio it had been installed flush with when we started that yard. This shows you the soil pit that I probably should have dug when we were shopping for a house, but didn't think to do in the city. And it this is about five years into this, this organic matter crusade that Anne was on. Her pruning shears are there on the right, and you can see that we still have till at depth. We didn't dig, we didn't roto-till, we just kept adding organic matter to the surface and letting it decay, just kept feeding the soil as long as it was eating that stuff. And you can see our leaves and wood chips at the top but what do you what do we have in here? You know, the plant roots are going down, then they go sideways. They're not going into that till. But within about five years, we had two inches of halfway decent soil. This is a lot faster than nature makes soil. And this started to turn out optimus. It also gave us a really nice garden. Uh, the neighbors that in the back are perfectly fine people, but we really enjoy not seeing them anymore. Um, and we essentially, for our own of enjoyment and mental health, having a really nice garden has, has taught me the value of that. We grow a lot of our food in the yard in the planting beds that received extra attention from things like biochar that we, we were adding in most of our worm compost. Um, and we've sort of gone to growing mostly salad greens because there's so many great farmers at the farmer's markets in Seattle now that it just doesn't make sense for us to grow vegetables. Um, but what was underpinning it all? It was the changes in our soil. This shows you the soil that we had at the start. Uh, there's a, some places on the property where we have not done anything to, and we still have our original soil. It has less than a half a percent organic matter. The soil on the right is what we have now. It's pushing 10% organic matter. And so we've gone from less than 1% to 10% in about 15 years. It's not quite a percent a year. It's about two thirds of a percent a year in terms of long-term change. Turns out that that's at the high end of what farmers I visited much later were doing on farms around the world. We've managed to store something like eight tons of carbon in our yard simply through gardening practices. Just think if everybody in Seattle or the Northwest did this to their yard instead of what we have been doing. Well, and it turns out that we weren't the ones actually doing all the work. And this is how Ann and I got into thinking about the role of microbial life in soil fertility. Because it turns out it was the bacteria and fungi that were breaking down all that organic matter that kept disappearing and that at the start we were wondering, you know, are our neighbors coming and stealing their leaves back? You know, what's going on? This stuff was decaying very fast and these guys were the ones doing the heavy lifting. And they in turn 
uh, were turning that organic matter back into living biomass. Uh, and they would be consumed by nematodes and microarthropods, uh, which, as with any other organism that consumes something when you excrete something, um, basically, well, you excrete it in a different form. And the stuff coming out of these guys after eating these guys who ate the organic matter is basically fertilizer. It's basically what we like to think of as micro manure. And so we started to well, view our soil as an area where we have underground livestock that if we feed them organic matter, they are manuring, they are fertilizing our garden from the inside out. And little did I know that that turns out to be a very similar to the philosophy behind some of the farmers that would end up visiting years later. Um, and so we started to look into what's the role of these microorganisms, the bacteria and the fungi in the soil, in essentially building and maintaining soil fertility. And in that research, which is essentially synthetic research, we were researching other people's research to find out what they knew that we could bring into our sphere, we learned about this new word for us, the rhizosphere, the, the zone around the roots of a plant. And it's a zone that has more life than, than almost anywhere else on the planet. It's incredibly life dense. If you want to find a whole lot of microorganisms, go look around the roots of your plants, especially in an organic matter rich soil. Um, and we were kind of surprised by that because, uh, you know, we had been thinking, as many people do, I think, that, you know, microbes equal germs, they're pests and pathogens. Well, and so why would, why would plants have so many pests around the roots? Well, it turns out we have learned something that was even more mysterious at the time, which is that plants push out of their roots up to 30 40 to 40% of the material they capture through photosynthesis. They push out of their roots as exudates. And what are those exudates? Things that exude out of the roots, they are things like complex carb their carbohydrates, both simple and complex, sugars, proteins. And last spring, a paper came out documenting plants pushing lipids, pushing fats out of their roots. What does that sound like? Lunch. They're pushing nutri nutrients out of their roots and into the soil. And microorganisms are basically coming to that buffet that plants are setting for them in the soil. And the plants aren't doing that to feed pests and pathogens. That would be a terrible evolutionary strategy. And yet, what you see when you look back at the oldest plant fossils that we have a record of is that there are mycorrhizal fungi intertwined with their roots. These partnerships between plants and microorganisms in the soil go back to the colonization of the continents by plants. So what's happening? Well, the plants are basically have offshored some of their chemical production, and they do it by feeding the microbes in the soil, these root exudates, the microbes then consume those exudates and make things that are beneficial to the plants that the plants take back up. So Anne, Anne and I liken it to a biological bazaar where the plants are trading nutrients, metabolites, and exudates with the microorganisms in the soil. So the plants are pushing out the root exudates. Uh, the microbes consume them before they get more than about a millimeter to a centimeter from the roots. Uh, they convert them into metabolites that the plants take back up. What are some of those kind of metabolites? Things like plant growth promoting hormones. The bacteria in the soil can be making hormones to promote the growth of plants. And it turns out that there's very specific uh, and different communities of microorganisms that grow around the roots of different kinds of plants, and the plants push out different kinds of root exudates to attract different kinds of microorganisms. In other words, there's a set of symbiotic relationships, symbioses in the soil that are very parallel in a way the kind of things we know about between pollinators and flowers in the above ground world that we can see. But these kind of relationships have been below ground and out of mind in what Ann and I call the hidden half of nature, so that we've only recently fully realized the extent and importance of those relationships. We've known about aspects of them for 100 years, but the degree to which they actually support plant health and um, uh, assist in nutrient acquisition and provisioning to plants and plant defense are all fairly new. And what the, basically this means is that we can think of plants as having a diet. And we can think of two end member diets, what Anne and I have called the fertilizer diet, and what we call the soil life diet in the book, and we might probably should have called the soil health diet. Um, is where if you have a plant that you give it all the macronutrients that it needs, uh, the things that we tend to think of as fertilizers, N, P, and K, um, you can basically grow a plant that's big. Every gardener knows, that, or a farmer knows, that if you have a very degraded soil, and you use fertilizer, you can grow a bigger plant and get a higher yield. Sort of no debate or argument about that. But what's happening to the health of the plant? A plant that's fed most of the micronutrients, uh, most of the macronutrients it needs, doesn't invest as much in its root system. It turns into what Ann and I will liken to in 
potato crops, uh, he'll put out less exudates, and they'll be getting less of the beneficial microbial metabolites and less uh, micronutrients um, from those the microorganisms in the soil that used to trade those to plants for cut of the sugary cut of the photosynthetic harvest. Um, on the other hand, if you grow a plant in um, organic matter, life-rich filled soil, you'll be getting much more of the micronutrients and beneficial microbial metabolites that support plant health. There's a very different way of looking and thinking about plant nutrition. And this led, us, this led me to think about, well, what does this all mean for the, the, the composition of our crops and our ability to maintain agriculture at a global scale? Could we actually generate at a global scale the kind of results that we generated in our yard through um, adding organic matter and cultivating the beneficial life in soils? And that led me to take six months off from my, my day job and go visit farms around the world to actually ask the question of whether we could turn soil like this into soil like this. These, this the answer is yes, there's a demonstration right there. These are long-term agricultural research plots at The Ohio State University that demonstrate the difference over 20 years of adding compost and mulch to a, a no-till soil. This is what you got, just no-till. This is if you added organic matter as well. It's like night and day, it's like our yard. It's like the difference between those um, North Carolina farms. And the basic message is that in visiting farms around the world, I basically saw that how adopting the principles of conservation agriculture uh, could match conventional crop yields uh, using far less oil and agrochemicals. It also had the benefit of rebuilding soil organic matter and rebuilding the of land. What were those three principles? Well, they're actually fairly simple. Minimal or no disturbance of the land. Don't rototill, don't till, no plowing. Basically, don't break up those mycorrhizal fungi. Don't stir up the soil biology. Let it, let it thrive instead. Um, maintain a permanent ground cover. If you're in a farming situation, plant cover crops. If you're in a garden, keep, the, keep a low thing in between the big things. Uh, and incl include legumes in your rotation. Be very wise to get nitrogen in, into the soil. And adopt diverse crop rotations. Um, those three things, ditching the plow, covering up, and growing diversity, together were the common elements of all the farmers that I visited who had had remarkable results in restoring fertility to their land. People who had adopted just one or two of these had less success. Those three points, ditching the plow, covering up, and growing diversity, define a new system of farming that is 180 degrees from where we've conventionally thought about managing the soil for the last century, where we've used intensive tillage, uh, relied on agrochemicals uh, dominantly for um, for fertility, and we have grown monocultures or functional monocultures, one or two crops. Um, and I'm not talking about the difference between organic and conventional agriculture. I'll mention that a little more later. But these kind of ideas can apply to both systems. And so how would you do that? This shows you uh, Ohio farmer uh, David Brandt, who is modeling his no -till, uh, a no-till planter, to show you essentially, well, how would you plant without plowing. Basically, you put one of these devices behind your tractor. There's a wheel that bait, that cuts a little trench into the soil. You drop a seed down into it, and then you cover it back up by pushing the organic matter uh, back over it. This shows you what a freshly planted field looks like following one of those no-till planters around. Um, so the thing's running off this way. I just walked right behind it, took pictures, this, and con contrast this in your mind's eye to that field in the Palouse that had been, you know, when you're freshly plowed and you just have bare earth, there's no bare earth there. You can't even see the soil. The rain doesn't see the soil either. The wind doesn't see the soil. In terms of cover crops, there's other technological innovations that really uh, allow uh, managing cover crops in different ways. There's, you know, uh, tillage plowing has been the uh, long-term way of doing it. Herbicides became very popular and helped spread the uh, spread of no-till in the last couple decades. But there's other more recent innovations that are actually starting to replace those herbicides. And things like this, this crop roller that Jeff Moyer, the, um, the director of the Rodale Institute back in Pennsylvania, is modeling for us here. And it's a thing, it's a simple attachment that you can put on the front of a no-till planter and use it to essentially steamroller over your cover crop growing in between the residue of, of a last crop. And these, these, these metal chevrons, when it, base, when it rolls over a plant, knocks the plant down, crimps it, and breaks the stem. So if you put one of these things on the front of your no-till planter, then in a single pass of the tractor, you can knock down a cover crop, turn it into mulch, and plant through it. 
your next pass of the tractor is simply to, um, to harvest. These things don't work in all areas, and they don't work in all climates necessarily, or all soils, but they're an illustration of the kind of ingenuity you can bring to the problem of, oh, how would we actually adopt these three principles? And one of the key messages I find visiting farmers around the world is that the practices that they adopt are not the same in places like the Dakotas or Ghana or places that I'll show you in a moment, but the principles that they're following in those applications are translatable. They are generalizable but we have to figure out how to adapt them to different regions. Uh, this shows you uh, Dwayne Beck from Dakota Lakes Research Farm. Uh, he's a gentleman that has pioneered the application of, of, of no-till with cover crops, and they're starting to get into diverse rotations and even bringing livestock back onto the land in the area around South, South Dakota. Why, why did I visit him first? Uh, the cover of that dirt book over there, that if you look at it, that's a picture from the Dust Bowl in his neighborhood. I went back to literally the poster child region for soil erosion in the United States and looked at what have they done since then. And in the area where the farmers have followed his lead and adopted no-till with cover crops and they're starting in on diverse rotations, they have literally shut erosion down and they're bringing their soil back to life. And they're doing it profitably, actually very profitably. And why is that? Because by adopting no-till cover crops and complex rotations, they've reduced their use of diesel fertilizer and pesticide by more than half. And if you think about what are the high expense items on a modern farm, it's those three. So, and what happened to their yields? Because the, their expenses are only half the equation, right? Well, their yields went up. Not, not by a lot on, these, on this particular example, but they went up. It's not a question of the environment versus the economy. These guys were able to actually be more profitable by using practices that had a lower environmental footprint and that radically transformed their soil. They've taken their soil from less than a percent organic matter. In fact, they're up back in the five to six percent range now, um, which for a fairly dry area is pretty darn good. When I left Dwayne's farm uh, and the farmers he was working with, it got up to about 20,000 um, hectares, if I recall. Um, and when I left there, so some fairly large, you know, horizon to horizon kind of farms in the Dakotas. When I left, I asked him, did the same practices that he was using work on small subsistence farms in Africa? And he basically looked at me and said, well, don't ask me, go ask Kofi Boa. He's already done it. Um, so I got in a plane, I went to Ghana and interviewed this gentleman here, Kofi Boa, who's the director of the uh, No-Till Research Center in, near Kumasi, Ghana, and notice his hat. It says it all right there, got dirt, get soil. That's the game. But he's using totally different practices than Dwayne Beck. He's following the same principles, those principles of conservation agriculture. But the practices he uses are different. They tend to grow multiple crops. They get their diversity all at once, not between their crops as cover crops, but by growing three to four crops in a field at one time. But notice, there's no bare soil. All the crop residue is still on the ground. Um, what Kofi's done is he's taken uh, the, the villagers uh, near his farm, from their traditional slash and burn methods, uh, straight to no till with cover crops and a diversity of crops, straight to conservation agriculture, skipping over the Green Revolution. Now, why did they do? Why did they skip that? Because the, if you think about how to change farming with subsistence farmers who don't have capital, the idea of selling them fertilizer and patented seeds is kind of a non-starter because they can't afford to buy them. So the Green Revolution, too, for Africa is kind of a recipe for growing mid-sized farms, not subsistence farms. What Kofi was able to do is with working with these principles of conservation agriculture, um, without any increase in inputs, simply with changing their farming practices, he was able to get to basically shut erosion off, uh, where with the traditional slash and burn, he had 20 times the erosion as you did with no-till. And what happened to their crop yields? Their corn yields tripled, their cowpea yields doubled. And for subsistence farmers, that's huge. If you can double or triple crop yields, that's what the Green Revolution did with great expense for agrochemicals. Um, so I left very impressed with what Kofi had done. Of course, the practices he relied on were completely different than the ones Dwayne Beck relied on. But the principles he was following were identical. The, last, the other two farmers I want to talk briefly about are uh, Gabe Brown and David Brandt. They're a pair of farmers who are both, uh, they're both ranchers. They both raise livestock, but they raised very different kind of livestock. 
Gabe Brown is raising livestock you'd probably recognize as livestock. Cows and chickens, and he's getting into pigs as well. Uh, and he's basically a guy who convinced me that uh, cattle can actually be a tool of soil restoration rather than a agent of soil degradation. I had studied uh, gully erosion in the California coast ranges where the dairies in the 1890s caused the great gullies. You can see if you just go north of San Francisco and walk around the Marin Headlands, you can, you can narrow the decade that they actually were incised. Um, but Gabe basically convinced me that cattle could actually rebuild soil fertility. And the problem wasn't livestock. The problem was how we managed the livestock. The problem was ours to own, not the cows. Um, made me feel much better about eating ribs and burgers again. But that's. Um, but Gabe has used his livestock to restore fertility to his uh, uh, prairie soils and his, his um, market garden that I'll show you in a minute. But David Brandt here is also raises livestock, but he calls his livestock well, his livestock are invisible. They are microbes. They live below ground. And what he feeds them are things like this, this radish. Um, he grows, uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a commercial corn and soybean farmer. That's what he sells into the commodity crop markets. But he raises all kinds of other things. He also, he raises up to 10 or 12 different species of cover crops in between his commercial crops, including radishes that he, base, he considers fodder for his microbial herbs that are getting the nutrition out of the mineral particles in the soil, getting them into the radishes, which then when he kills them as he rolls over them with the crop roller, um, they decay and that stuff has gone from the subsoil into the topsoil where his plants can access it and fertilize his cash crops. Notice his neighbor's fields. They have a different color than his fields. His neighbor's fields are yellow, those sickly soybeans back there. The green stuff that's within them, those are very healthy glyphosate resistant weeds. They cover up to, a, up to a quarter to a third by my visual estimation of the area of his neighbor's farms. That's a direct hit yields, and it shows when you look at the on-farm economics. I didn't see a single weed on David Brandt's fields. He says he plants weeds in, his, in effect. He didn't put in quite those words, but he plants cover crops, and he kills them before they go to seed. He's controlling what's growing on his land. Um, and if you compare the economics of David's farm to his neighbor's, his neighbors are using full tillage with 200 pounds of nitrogen, two and a half quarts of Roundup an acre. That costs about 500 bucks an acre to, to do. In the 2015, the year I visited, the corn yield that his neighbors were getting on average is about 100 bushels an acre. That pencils out at a net loss of $100 per acre. Even a geologist can tell you that that's a bad business model. The harder you work, the more you lose. It's kind of like being a professor. What, how does that compare to David Brandt's? Economics, he's been doing no-till for 44 years. He's taken his soil from less than a percent organic matter up to about 8%, and the native forest here is about 6%. He's, take, he's overshot the natural organic matter content of his soils. And he's done it by doing no-till for 44 years. He added cover crops a couple, de uh, couple decades ago. He's been growing his diverse cover crop uh, mixes for the last uh, uh, half decade or so. He does no tillage, uses about an eighth of the nitrogen, a fifth of the Roundup. He's not an organic farmer. I started teasing him that he's organic-ish, though, because he's not using very much in the way of chemicals at all anymore. Total cost to him, about 320 bucks an acre. His yield was 80% higher than his neighbor's. I think some of that's because he, he uses his whole field and doesn't have as many weeds. He's also got really fertile soil. Bottom line is it penciled out at that same market price for the corn he was getting at a profit of 400 bucks an acre. That's a good business model. This is what turned me into an optimist that these kind of ideas and thinking might actually spread among farming communities because the economics are starting to pencil out. The cost of inputs have gotten so high and the ability of farmers to grow crops has gotten so good that they have depressed prices for what they grow and they have high costs for doing it under conventional methods. And the one sort of lever that they have um, is to change up their practices. And if they can learn how to do things in ways that they're spending less on inputs, they can be more profitable. And so um, there's another dimension to doing that and that's uh, what Gabe Brown has been doing with his, on his farm. He's been bringing livestock back in. So instead of using a plow, an herbicide uh, or a crop roller to manage his weeds. He's been experimenting with bringing his cattle back from his ranching operation and bringing his cattle in to graze off the cover crops he grows after his commercial crops.
because uh, he does both livestock and he does farming. And then he brings chickens in uh, after the cows to, to eat the, the grubs or the maggots out of the cow. Uh, the cow exudates. And, um, and he's basically adding chickens, eggs, and beef to what he sells. And he's using livestock to accelerate the breakdown and the cycling of his cover crops. So what he, the, key, the magic that he's doing is he's thinking about his cycles as the root of the productivity of his farm, and he's spinning off different um, um, enterprises that can profit off of each step of that. Uh, and he's actually been quite profitable as well. Um, he's gotten into this whole, the whole the CS, the, not a CSA, but a farmer's market kind of marketing for a lot of his, his products. But what has he done to his soil? Um, he would argue to you, and I agree with him fully, that the, the most valuable tool on a farm is a shovel. Just to dig a hole and look at your soil and do it with your neighbor's soil. This is Gabe's soil on uh, his market garden, uh, where it has received sort of the most attention on his farm. Um, it's pretty rich black earth. This soil is from his neighbor's organic farm. Uh, it's an organic farm that uh, is uses conventional tillage, and it illustrates pretty well sort of, you know, why you might want to think about ditching the plow uh, and why what I'm talking about with this new suite of practices isn't really the same old conventional versus organic debate. It's more about how do you build soil health and it can work in both systems. Because Gabe is someone who has essentially weaned himself off of agrochemicals by restoring the fertility of his land. He's not organic certified, but rather eat stuff coming off his farm than almost anybody else's farm I've ever been on. And so what can you uh, boil this down to in terms of advice for how to rebuild soil fertility? Ditch the plow, cover up, and grow diversity. It's as simple as I can put it. The three key points. Um, those things, three things together, define a new philosophy and system of farming that can have transformative effects on soils in remarkably short time frames. In the order of changes in a couple years and really seeing radical changes in a decade or two. Um, what are the kind of benefits? Comparable increased yields, greatly reduced fossil fuel, fertilizer, and pesticide use, greatly increased soil carbon. That color change in, in soil basically translates into directly into soil carbon. Great higher water retention and therefore crop resilience and, and less pollution. But I think most importantly, it can be more profitable for farmers because by spending less, grow as much, if not more, the spread on their investment is actually better. And that would be for actually wider adoption. And I just want to emphasize, I've said it twice, I'll say it a third time, this is not really a question of organic versus GMO or agrotech. Um, I like to view conservation agriculture, the idea of merging the best of ancient wisdom with the best of modern technology. Cover crops and crop rotations are not new ideas. These are ideas that have been experimented with and used in societies around the world. No-till is a fairly new idea, especially at a large scale. Getting those two to work together is really what it's all about in terms of merging ancient wisdom and modern technology. And it's all about using soil ecology, understanding of how to cultivate the roles of beneficial microbes. So it may be a little odd for geologists to be talking about it in all this, and I'm certainly not doing research on soil microbiology. I wouldn't know how to begin. But I can certainly see the potential and importance of the work that people are doing in that area. It's incredibly important. Um, and there's this other dimension to it in terms of how much carbon we could actually sequester in the world's farmland soils. And I wrestled with that a bit in looking at the book. What I'll do today is simply advertise that there's a huge range of estimates. Um, there needs to end because there's a huge range of potential. Ryan Lau, uh, the soil scientist at Ohio State University, uh, who I interviewed in the book, conservatively estimates we could offset you know, maybe 10% plus minus 5% of global fossil fuel emissions. Uh, in that manner for the decade, we could be basically filling soils back up with carbon. At the other end of the spectrum, the Rodale Institute estimates that we could more than fully offset global fossil fuel emissions. 10% to 100%, that's the whole game right there. It's the whole spectrum. The point I want to make is that we should, the kinds of practices you would do to sequester carbon in soils for, for climate issues are the same kind of things you do to rebuild soil fertility, to grow food or improve on farm economics. We should be doing these things anyway and take as much of a climate benefit as we can get out of it. 
Uh, and there's other ways to think about doing that uh, in terms of biochar. This is a photo from down in the Amazon, the famous terra preta soils, the black earths of the Amazon that were built by people over generations of returning their organic matter to the fields outside their villages and using biochar. Um, organic matter that's been combusted in a low oxygen environment and turned into charcoal. Um, we have things like Tagro um, that you all are obviously fairly familiar with um, and the idea of what do we do with our urban waste stream? How can we actually recycle the organic matter that we're, we're essentially wasting in cities by not taking that and turning it back into a productive resource? Really impressed with the, the stuff that the city of Tacoma is producing and the enthusiasm which some of the gardeners in the city of Tacoma are, um, are approaching the idea of buying back their own exudates after having had them processed through the, um, through the Tagro plant and the, the, the quality and the abundance of the produce they're able to produce. There's a real model, I think, there for thinking about how to use urban organic wastes as an engine to grow food in cities to feed the population of the future. And I think that we're really on the cusp of what I'd like to call um, the fifth agricultural revolution. And if you'll indulge me for a moment more, uh, I will um, basically go through the first four. The idea of cultivation and tillage in the first place was radical. The idea of agriculture, that we can plant stuff and stop moving around and stay in one place and actually grow things. was what I like to think of as the first agricultural revolution. The second one was someone we started to realize that, oh, we need to actually take care of the soil. And some of the early ideas of crop rotation and um, soil husbandry that developed in different places around the world, planting legumes along with our crops, uh, was what I like to call the second agricultural revolution. And this famous quote from Leonardo da Vinci um, is actually as true today, 500 years later, as it was when he first, when he first wrote it backwards in a mirror. How many other areas of science can you say that about? Take some random quote from a, a dead white guy from 500 years ago, and it's still true. The third agricultural revolution, uh, that when mechanization and industrialization radically transformed agriculture in the 19th and 20th centuries, greatly increased crop production, um, but it also added a third of the carbon dioxide to the atmosphere that's been added since the Industrial Revolution came from plowing up the plains and the, and the Russian steppes, not out of a tailpipe, not out of a smokestack. Think about that. A third degrading soil land. And if you look at the last book that the grandfather of the modern fertilizer industry, Justice von Liebig, wrote, we all sort of know about his 1840 book where he demonstrated that if you add certain uh, chemical elements to soils, you can get a boost to sort of the, what started uh, the fertilizer industry. He also wrote another book at the end of his career in 1863 called The Natural Laws of Husbandry, in which that he basically recommended returning organic matter to the fields, returning urban sewage to fields um, to provide crops with a full complement of nutrients. He's, as far as I can tell, he's one of the first people to argue we needed to close the loop in sort of modern parlance and take our waste products back to the fields they came from. And he was basically arguing that because he saw by the end of his career that if we only added one or two chemical elements, one or two major fertilizers, we would run out of the micronutrients that the plant bodies and our body need for health. And that we needed to essentially start recycling organic matter at a large scale. He was consulting to the city of London about doing this right at the time that the first urban sewage systems were put in and his ideas got completely sidelined and shelved. The fourth revolution was the Green Revolution in biotechnology in the 20th century. There's no doubt that the Green Revolution increased crop yields uh, in, um, in the least developed countries. Whether uh, subsistence farmers had access to that is a whole other story, uh, but that's, that's sort of longer than the time we have available. Biotechnology that gave us GMO crops and things, you know, have not increased crop yields, but they've made weed control easier um, and arguably reduced the reliance on some pesticides. Uh, but what I want to, and I don't feel like litigating those particular arguments, what I want to emphasize is that I think we're on the cusp of a fifth agricultural revolution that could be every bit as important and influential in the end as those first four. And that's thinking about soil health as the lens through which to evaluate agricultural practices. If practices build soil health and fertility, they're good and worth pursuing. If they degrade soil health, they are of limited utility over the long run. Uh, and this is where I think that these ideas of, of conservation agriculture, as could be applied to both conventional and organic agriculture, really have 
a lot to offer society. And what can they help us with? Well, the long-term problem of feeding the world, uh, if we take those, those trends that I talked about at the start of the, of the talk, if we don't restore fertility to land, those trends are going like, to crash into each other later this century. Um, but if we can actually grow as much with using less, uh, fewer inputs, and if, we, and if we can actually restore fertility to the land, take our, the model from our yard, the degraded farmland around the world, we have a chance of feeding the future. Uh, we could also sequester a lot of carbon to help with the climate problem. We could, um, it would help with environmental degradation, but it would also, and importantly, help restore profitability to rural areas and to farms uh, across America and around the world, which is equally, I think, important in terms of building a sustainable farming system. So I'll uh, uh, leave it there. You're right because you want people to read your books. Uh, the, the encouragement there is obvious. If you're, in, if you're interested in... Um, Tweeting about stuff, you can use our, our handle at dig, the, the number two, grow. If you want to um, check out our website then, and see whether you're interested in the books, feel free to grade stuff there. So anyway, thank you very much for your attention and for the work that you do in drawing attention to this large scale problem of organic matter recycling. You know, it's, it really, really is hugely important at a global scale. So thank you very much.